Last week, we talked about the digital factory, in particular, building the digital factory, what that looks like, uh, and what we're doing with our technology around building and construction, uh, but as it applies to digital factory. Uh, and this week, we're continuing that theme. We're talking about manufacturing. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be specific to the digital factory, but it's a nice vehicle for, to talk about what's going on in manufacturing. So our session today is gonna be, be about just, just 60 minutes. Uh, Tony Turtle from Techsoft is gonna be bringing us through uh, some, some demos, and, and then Angelo is also gonna be talking about what Stratasys uh, and GrabCAD, GrabCAD Print are, are, are doing in this space. So uh, keep yourself muted if you could during this, this session. We would appreciate that. If you have any questions, um, type them in the chat. There'll be opportunities both after the Techsoft presentation and the Stratasys presentation to, to answer those questions. And that makes it more enjoyable for everyone. So if you do have one, um, please type it there in the chat and we'll try to address that. Uh, but yeah, let's, let's get started. And I am sharing, so that's great. So here at Techsoft, our focus is building engineering SDKs. If you're not familiar with us, we have a number of different SDKs. We either build in-house or we distribute. Uh, so some of our in-house SDKs allow you to read over 30 different file formats from, from the popular CAD file formats, as well as being able to provide visualization of that on desktop, mobile, and, and also with, within a web page. We have publishing SDKs for creating rich 3D PDFs or standalone HTMLs. And we also resell uh, modeling toolkits from Siemens and from MachineWorks for solid modeling, as well as uh, tessellated mesh modeling, the polygonical toolkits used for that. Uh, we're not really known well uh, as a uh, product that you can purchase, let's say from an e-store, but it's all of our partners that are known well. And, and we're really proud to be working with you and grateful for over 500 different engineering software companies to be partnering with. What we're driven to uh, is to fuel innovation. And it's really through your innovation. So we're, we're uh, really driven to create some of the best technology when it comes to CAD access and visualization. But it's, it's really you guys, our community, that are doing some of the, the most interesting things with this and addressing very, very tough problems out uh, in the world today. Uh, it could be creating cars that um, don't use gas or more efficient buildings. But now more than ever, uh, in a time of global pandemic and, and, and problems, right? Um, we see all of our partners really stepping up to the plate, really stepping up um, and, uh, and solving these or, or attempting to solve those or will solve them in the future, working hard um, to kind of lean in together uh, to fix what's broken. Uh, we see the additive manufacturing community really rallying behind a need to rapidly create uh, protective equipment. Companies like Stratasys, uh, like EOS, uh, like 3D Systems, creating protective equipment or, or fixing broken supply chains. Uh, a number of different companies providing their software, uh, like, like Oracle, for free, uh, for learning, or changing the way in which they do licensing to allow for a work-at-home workforce uh, having to move out of the physical offices and be remote. Uh, we also see companies like ANSYS Fluent modeling the way in which uh, this disease is being transferred, maybe through particulate matter in a slipstream. And so we're, we're very grateful to be working with you and to seeing, see how you are using our, our tools and your software to solve these problems. Well, the problems persist today and, and uh, we're talking about the digital factory. Well, what is, what is the digital factory? We, we know in manufacturing, many uh, people have been talking about the digital twin for years now, uh, the, the uh, virtual representation of what's physically being made or the digital representation of, of a machine or an assembly. Um, that's not new. But what we're seeing is the, uh, the gathering of all of the data, all of the digital twins of everything that goes into the factory, including the factory itself. So we talked about building and construction, and uh, there's a digital representation of the building itself, so the factory, and then all of the machines that go into that factory, uh, the connection of those machines to systems, 
uh, the overlay of IoT data on top of those machines, uh, what those machines are uh, doing in real time, the, the robotic systems, as well as the actual objects that those machines are creating and manufacturing and the output of that factory. So all of this digital data, all, all of this virtual information and real-time information brought together is the digital factory. And uh, this, this is a lot of data, so it's hard to navigate. It also is coming from numerous different sources. So each of those different virtual models or digital twins can be coming from a different CAD system. Uh, and the amount, the sheer volume of this data um, is, is huge. The amount of data being generated from, from IoT, from point scans, all the metadata, additional databases. Uh, this is what the digital factory is. And what we would like to talk about is how to simulate and optimize that. We don't want to talk about uh, how to build the digital factory, how to operate the digital factory, but what's happening in terms of, of innovation in this space, particularly when it comes to our partners, and hopefully we can all grow together. So there's a lot of opportunities to, to leverage that data, to take value from that, uh, to simulate and to optimize the way in which these factories are working. We're going to talk about just three kind of main ideas around how to simulate and optimize the digital factory, but there, there obviously are many. Uh, so the first one is around flow and process. So this is uh, the flow of material that's being produced and the processes in which we're, we're creating in that factory and the connection of different robotic cells, uh, delivery systems, the flow of material. We can simulate that uh, and through that we can optimize. We're also going to talk about the, the actual machines in that factory. How do we, we optimize their control, simulate and optimize that, so the robots, the CNC machines, the inspection machines. And then lastly, we're going to take a look at the human element and, and how do we improve operations now that we have all of this data, how can we make the human factor more efficient at what they're doing. So when it comes to simulate and optimizing um, flow and processes, uh, this is again the, the flow of material uh, and the way in which these, these different machines are, are brought together and are able to uh, really work through the workflows. Now, one thing you're gonna notice throughout this presentation, we're gonna try to highlight a number of our, our different partners in this space. So anytime you see a corporate mark or logo, that's gonna be somebody that is using TechSoft technology in one way or another. And we just wanna uh, bring some attention to them. There are, there are again, hundreds in this space. Many, um, we are not able to add all of them, um, but some of, the, some of the main players in particularly the digital factory space uh, we see several when it, come, when it comes to flow and process. So if you, if you want to be laying out just uh, your, your physical environment, um, uh, embodied engineering, uh, which was, was known as salt and pepper, they're doing some interesting work with, um, with VR headsets and laying out just a, a workspace. Does this workspace work for me? Uh, does it make sense? And having a, a virtual headset, if we're able to bring in that, that digital environment and kind of, before we build it, see and actually get an operator to kind of stand around and design their workspace or look at it um, and, and evaluate ergonomics um, so that it's, it eases their ability or, or improves their ability to get their job done. Uh, that's really effective. We, we see other companies modeling the way in which data flows, flows or, or models flow through and, and uh, manufacturing systems are able to take their material from one, um, one site to another uh, in the factory. Uh, that too enables them to, to model a flow and process uh, and design their factory in an intelligent way. Where this becomes really exciting and interesting is we can start asking questions about, well, what if, uh, what if we replace an operator with a robot? Or what if we, can ch we change the configuration of this space? Or what if we can only have half the staff in our factory uh, doing their job because of a global pandemic? It, how does that change things? Or how do I have to um, pivot and change the way in which I'm doing my work? And so we're able to model that out before we actually put people on the floor or, or build the factory. And, and that becomes um, really interesting and, and is able to save time and, and cost by simulating um, that scenario. Another way in which we see the, uh, the, the digital factory and all that data being uh, leveraged is through 
optimizing, uh, simulating, and optimizing machine control. So it could be optimizing uh, robot, uh, robots, uh, like here. Uh, Dur is is uh, enabling their um, machine programmers to optimize the way in which uh, they program their their robots to um, program their paths. They can either do it on, on a online or an offline way. Uh, it, it really allows them to uh, test what is going to happen before implementing it, and it, it drastically improves the way in, in which um, they're able to get, get their job done um, and, and run their, their robots, especially without collisions, right? So we would, we would hate for a robotic arm to, to run into the pillar of that, that car, and they're using Hoops Visualize here on, on the monitor to, to graphically show what what is going to happen before actually executing it there um, on the assembly line. Well, good simulation starts with good data, and the data is um, more than just the boundary representation or the, or the visual data that goes into the part or the machine, uh, but we see the data coming from the CAD system being much richer, and we're working hard at TechSoft using our Hoops Exchange Toolkit to give access to uh, additional CAD data, like in this case, features for holes and slots in the feature tree. This allows people to make more informed decisions about how to manufacture the part. Uh, so here we're seeing Hoops Exchange brought in this, um, this test part and Hoops Visualize, visualizing it here within the Hoops Demo Viewer. This is kind of a, a demo application that we've built to showcase some of the features of, of our different SDKs. Additionally, we have product manufacturing information that we're able to extract from the majority of our CAD files that support it. And that allows for um, being able to display it visually, just like it's shown in the CAD system on how to manufacture this part uh, when it comes to the, the tolerances and, and the dimensions. Uh, but we also provide it in a semantic way that can be automatically read from the file and given to, not interpreted visually, but given right to the machine. Some other areas that we've been working on uh, have to be around material definition. So what is this part made of? Uh, as well as mating information of parts within an assembly. So how is this part connected to another part and constrained by uh, a plane or another feature? And that's, that's something new to Hoops Exchange and, and something we're excited to be bringing to, to the industry, giving you rich engineering data from, from the CAD parts that are going to be engineered. Well, what can you do with this? We see a number of different people creating manufacturing as a service applications, leveraging the cloud and web that allows people to upload files to a thin web client. And within that, that system, using the rich data that they extract from the CAD file uh, to make intelligent decisions around how this part is going to ma be manufactured. Uh, in fact, even giving real-time or close to real-time quotes without the need for an operator to go and create a quote because they know, can this be manufactured? What, what's the tolerance that it needs to be manufactured to? Um, they're leveraging a data from past jobs that they've been able to record and actually apply some machine learning to the way in which information is, is being processed and with, with a reasonable uh, degree of accuracy can give a good quote back to the partner immediately or, or their customer immediately um, to manufacture this part. And that real-time feedback is, is very useful. Uh, the other way in which they're, they're taking this data and processing it um, are they're leveraging particularly for additive manufacturing, they're leveraging a toolkit from Machine Works called Polygonica, which, which takes uh, the information that we provide to them uh, and, and clean it, fix it, heal it, um, analyze it, and prepare it for 3D printing very quickly. Uh, and so it could be CAD files, but many times when it comes to additive manufacturing, it's STL files that tend to be dirty, tend to have holes, tend to have problems with them. Um, is this manufacturable with, within the context of additive manufacturing? And what can I do to, to prepare it for that? One of the new features of Polygonica is, is thin wall analysis. And so is, is this the part of, part of the part uh, able to be printed within the con constraints of, of the machine? And if it's not, if it's too thin, uh, Polygonica allows you to automatically thicken those walls. And so really allowing very quick robust data processing for the additive space. But in both these cases, 
manufacturing as a service doesn't have to be just additive. It can also be um, using CNC machines and, and cam technology, being able to rapidly create parts uh, and give feedback to, to the software operator as well as, as to even the end user, the end customer. How else is rich data powering machines? Uh, and no matter what the machine is, if it's a, if it's a CNC machine, if it's, if it's a robot doing welding, or even um, automated uh, CMM and a, a quality assurance, you need to figure out what the important features are to, to machine, how do I do that, and, and how do I do that quickly? So each of these companies, in fact, are using Hoops Exchange to bring data in to their application uh, and are able to make and automate the, the path programming of, of their machines uh, to achieve the end goal of manufacturing, qualifying, uh, and distributing this, this part. So we look at companies like DP Technology with a, a Spree uh, CAM solution. They're not just leveraging Hoops Exchange, but also Siemens Parasolid to do solid modeling that enables them to create a very robust um, CAM package. Uh, they take advantage of the features that exist within the CAD file. Uh, and one of their end goals uh, are, is to do something called lights out manufacturing with with limited or, or no um, uh, input from, from the uh, CAM programmer, CNC programmer. We're not there yet, but that's, that's where the industry is going, is how do we make the life of, of the programmers as easy as possible and leverage the data that we, that we have access to. Uh, other advancements in the space around quality assurance and, and making sure that we manufactured the parts to the specification as it was originally in, in the, original, um, uh, the original part. Uh, GOM and, and other companies are doing that, not, not just through um, a, taking a, a, C, a CMM machine, but through, through rapid uh, analysis using visual technology to, to analyze if this part has, has been um, manufactured to spec and doing that with accuracy and, and extremely fast and, and not being invasive. So really exciting to see some of the work that, that they're doing. Well, how about the, the, the human aspect of this around operations? So now we have the factory, we have the machines, they have jobs to be working on. Well, what can we do to actually assist the life and help, help the life of, of the people that are working here in the factory or they're up in the control room? Um, and, and we see a, a couple different technologies that are, are really making um, some waves in this space. One in which is being invested in heavily is, is AR. And this is, seems to be the case more now, now more than ever. Uh, we see Microsoft uh, there on the right, kind of, uh, they, they've invested heavily uh, in their HoloLens technology, really addressing industry and enterprise, going away from entertainment, looking at industry and enterprise and how to enable them uh, with, with digital information. They have a whole suite of software tools that allow for remote assistance. So now you don't have to fly in uh, a, an expert, but actually you could have them be able to see what you're seeing through your device and actually annotate uh, in your view what they're talking about and coach you through um, a, a process of, let's say, maintenance or assembly that you might not be familiar with, but allows them to be present with you um, and walk you through that. Other companies uh, aren't leveraging headsets, but we see everybody or many people using tablets um, to be able to bring in digital information. So it could be just uh, work instructions on your tablet that steps you through things, but if we're able to augment that with uh, the visual cues of, of a real live video stream and overlay the digital on top of the real, now that becomes a very rapid tool for um, assisting you with maintenance or, um, or with work instructions, interactive work instructions and, and uh, training. So, so here in this image, maybe we're, we're looking at the, the different fasteners for these, um, these wires and the wire harnesses, how to, how to uh, uh, assemble and disassemble this, this complicated nest of, of wires and, um, and how do we enable people to do that. One of the problems in this space that many people are trying to solve is, is how do I take the digital and overlay it with with the real and like align them together. So so Tony from from TechSoft is going to talk us through some some technology that we've been experimenting with, but there's there's other ones as well. So Tony, are, yeah, it looks like you're unmuted. Great, thanks for joining us today. Why don't you uh, step us through what we have here? 
Yeah, absolutely. Let me just uh, go ahead and set the stage for it a little bit. Um, so what we're going to be looking at is a cross-platform mobile application that we have running on iOS and Android devices. Um, these applications are using the underlying AR SDKs uh, for their given devices. So for Android, that's AR Core, and for iOS, that's AR Kit. Uh, in addition to these base AR SDKs, these applications are using a technology called Microsoft Spatial Anchors, which is communicating and uh, or which is, means they're communicating with the server running in Microsoft Azure's cloud. And this Microsoft Spatial Anchors technology is basically supplementing these base AR kits in these Android and iOS applications um, and allowing them to kind of create a, a, collabor a collaborative environment um, in AR, which one of the issues with AR has been it's great, but there's really no way to create a shared space between multiple devices and multiple sessions. So let's go ahead and, and roll this video and take a look at, at one solution to that problem. So you're going to be seeing an Android device that is screen recording. Um, right now, you can see a 3D model being placed in that AR environment on the Android device. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to pan around this room. And you're going to see all these little dots. And that's going to be analyzing points of contrast in this environment and trying to kind of map out this space. And then we're going to go ahead and click and we're going to upload um, basically this virtual AR space that we're in to the Microsoft Spatial Anchors Cloud. What this is going to allow us to do is go on the other device and join the session that this Android device that we're recording from is in. And when we pan around with, with this device, it's going to go ahead, it's going to notice those points of interest and contrast. It's going to load in and see that it's in a shared space. And wouldn't you know, look there, there's the same anchor displayed on one device is loaded into the other device. Transformations like scaling, rotation, um, those are all done in real time and shared across the, the two devices via WebSocket technology. You're going to see a uh, selection that's occurring on one device popping up on the other. Um, so, you know, this is kind of just going to, or this is kind of amplifying that point that Jonathan was talking about, of, you know, being able to have, you know, somebody else that's not in that space help you or, you know, have uh, multiple people working on a machine bring up work instructions or, you know, show videos for maintenance steps and stuff like that. Um, so like, as I had said, you know, traditionally these AR experiences were restricted to kind of a single device in a single space. And what this new technology um, is doing, I said it was Microsoft Spatial Anchors, but Microsoft HoloLens has a solution. Um, there's definitely other solutions for this problem from other, um, other companies. And, and these solutions are allowing us to take an AR experience to the next level and make it a lot more functional to solve some of the problems that people are starting to see um, in these digital twins and digital factories. And that's, that's super cool. Thanks, Tony. And the graphics there, what's, what's powering the graphics? Yeah, so for our mobile applications, uh, this is basically gonna be, as I said, those base AR kits for those uh, iOS and Android devices. And then everything that you see is gonna be, uh, is gonna be rendered and visualized with hoops visualized. Um, okay. So it's a little bit of a collaborative effort between the iOS um, and Android base libraries and our technology as well. Uh, that's great. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. We'll be hearing from him a little bit later as well. So again, once we have all of this data, people have to interpret it and they have to work with it. And so how do we, how do we optimize its display? How do we optimize it or, or how do we just navigate it? And how do we use it to make intelligent decisions and control the machines out on the shop floor? One way in which that's being done is, is, is really through this tsunami of IoT data, trying to, to manage it and, and, and navigate it and store it. Um, and not just the internet of things, but what's called IIoT or the industrial internet of things. Uh, it's getting really big. Major CAD players like PTC have been investing in this place, uh, in this space. But other cloud providers like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, they have their own systems for collecting, storing, and then mining this information. One of the real benefits of that is we can, we can uh, be able to monitor, uh, create analytics, and do predictive maintenance. So if we knew what a failing machine looks like and are able to roll back and realize that the data coming out of this machine is indicative of the machine failing sometime in the next few months, we can bring it down for maintenance, uh, prevent it from breaking something, um, and be able to keep our overall uptime um, better by being able to do that predictive maintenance. 
So Tony, why don't you step us through some of the work we've been, we've been doing to integrate IoT data with, with our technology as well? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what we're going to take a look at here is actually a, an internal hackathon project that we had the opportunity to work on earlier this year. Um, it's going to be leveraging the Hoops Communicator technology as well as, as Jonathan had said earlier, AWS's Amazon Web Services IoT solution um, that basically creates what you could call a data pipeline to basically plumb and stream in real time data from IoT devices into a database for access um, from your application. So if we go ahead and roll this video, um, we're going to see these Arduino sensors that we had placed throughout our, our 3D office space that we had created. Um, and these, these Arduino devices are going to be located in a physical space within the, within the 3D model. And they have data that's associated with them that we're streaming from AWS and from the actual Arduinos themselves. So here you can see that that data is being pulled into Hoops Communicator and is actually able to be used to influence the scene. Um, you're seeing it there as like historical graphs. You're also seeing here a, an alternative view that's not 3D. We're using an open source technology called Chart.js to show historical trends on this IoT data that's associated with these devices in this 3D space. And another cool, another cool feature that we, we kind of implemented is that you can actually have that, that IoT data be interacted with in your scene, right? So what you're seeing here is, for example, on one of your IoT devices, maybe you want to set an alarm on a temperature setting. And if it goes out of whack, um, you know, you can, you can select or navigate to that device or you can set it to be red um, or something like that to kind of, you know, bring your attention to it. Um, so one of the cool things is that, that bringing this IoT data, it can go further than just visualizing it. Um, and you can actually have the IoT data influence your 3D world, or you could even take it a step further and you could issue commands to your IoT devices from this 3D space that we're in right now. Great, and, and just, you may have mentioned this for emphasis, what, what Hoops technology was powering that? Yeah, so um, you're gonna see a 3D model in that that's going to be translated to our internal format with Hoops Exchange, and all of the um, all of the cloud application is based off of Hoops Communicator and Hoops Web Viewer. Great. And if you want to take a look at this, I believe Tony is that on um, the TechSoft 3D Innovation Lab. Yeah, you should be able to go to uh, labs.techsoft. Or sorry, labs.techsoft3d.com um, and download that project. There's a, a little bit of setup you'll have to do, but uh, if it's something you're interested in, you can take a look at it and get it running. And we'd be yeah. happy to help you do so as well. I think there's a live live version too. You can just kick the tires on there. Yeah. Right. All right. What, what what are we looking at now? Cool. Yeah. Um, so all right. So one last thing for me. Um, you know, we were kind of messing around with IoT stuff, and we were messing around with AR stuff, and we thought, you know what, it'd be cool, pretty cool if we could get this IoT stuff in our AR application as well. Um, so what you're, you're seeing right now is that same, that same cross-platform application that we had um, displayed earlier. Um, but if we go ahead and launch this, we're going we're gonna to see a little bit of an IoT overlay inside of this. Um, so we're going to be using a pretty hefty model here. It's a 40 meg MakerBot. It's a very advanced model and very cool. Um, so once again, we just have to scan that space that we're in. We need to figure out you know, where we can place this. We're gonna step back and then we're gonna drop this model into the space. We can go ahead and scale it up and then look at that. We've got some cool selection. It's a very, a very cool model. Um, and then with the tap of a button, we can go ahead and we can bring in an IoT overlay. You can see it over on the left there that's, that's streaming in all of that data from our IoT devices in real time. Um, you know, so you could anchor these models here, you could assign them IDs, you could stream the data to them. It's, um, it's, it's pretty cool. The, the possibilities are really endless when it comes to this. There's really no limitations that the Hoops technology is placing on, on what you can do. Great. And that original data, what, what type of assembly was that? Yeah, so I believe this, uh, this cool MakerBot model that you're seeing was created uh, as a SolidWorks assembly. Okay. Um, and I believe it was like a 130 megabyte file and it's got like 122 unique parts in it. Uh, so it's a really, really big model, but we go ahead and we run that through Hoops Exchange to bring it into Hoops Communicate, or excuse me, to Hoops Visualize. Um, and we end up with a, a 38 megabyte uh, file that's a little bit more manageable. 
Great. Let's talk about like big data and, and management. So here we have a, another demo um, showcasing really the, the uh, dashboard for a digital factory. And so we have a bunch of information being displayed, energy consumption, what we, what we expect uh, the output of this factory to be. You know, if you were here last week, we, we talked through this, so this, this won't be too new to you, um, but it really showcases bringing that maker bot in with a tremendous number of other machines and show what the digital factory is possible, or what, you, what you can do with our technology to, to model, to navigate, um, and to control your digital factory and be able to visualize that data. So uh, it's all about the 3D. We, we bring in um, our, our 3D view here, being able to show a layout of the, the entire factory with a, a number of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, robotic systems as well as CNC machines. And I think there's a bunch of maker bots in there as well. Uh, this is being, all this data is being brought in using Hoops Exchange and being visualized with our, our web technology, Hoops Communicator. Um, we have a list of, of a couple hundred different machines that exist in this space. We can select on one of the, the uh, welding robots here in this list and it, we're able to automatically zoom to its location. We can do that with, with multiple um, different machines as, as well and kind of step through and, and, and look at your factory this way, as well as overlay uh, their utilization, what else is, is going on in that space. Uh, let's take it to a full screen view and, and uh, be able to really immerse ourselves and walk through the factory. Uh, now, you see a maker bot there. We have a tremendous number of machines. We're able to navigate that, but we're doing a fair amount of, of processing on top of Hoops Communicator in order to allow us to do that. So um, some, of, some of the work was making simplified versions of those machines. And then as we approach them or we ask for, for the particular machine, we're able to load in a, a higher fidelity version of it. Uh, here we've, we've uh, highlighted the uh, problematic machines and displayed a, a, a small chart above it that allows us to get real-time information about what's going, going on with, with either that machine or be able to quickly isolate problematic machines and be able to, to troubleshoot them. A few other things that we're doing is, is animations. We're, we're changing the way in which uh, the animations are being sampled in order to improve performance as, as well. But let's dig down into one of those machines. We can select it, we'll go to it. It, it loads that machine, the, the, the full fidelity, uh, uh, high uh, um, tessellated view. We're able to see that here in, in the preview as, as well as in, in our main view. But we can do it interesting things now with that because we have all of the data for that assembly. Uh, in, up in the, the right, we have um, a, a bill of material or, or, um, or kind of a, a segmented part of the bill of material for that particular assembly. We're able to select on, let's say the driller uh, and be able to display just that part here in the preview window. We're able to highlight it in the main, uh, the main window and then be, be able to provide some information around what, what is this part doing? What are the faults per month? When was it last serviced? And be able to bring in additional data and, and augment the 3D with that and be able to give you access to all of this maintenance information or IoT data. Uh, here's another case. We have a, a number of messages. Maybe a technician has been out on the, the floor and says, this, this part really needs to be replaced. On their tablet, they're able to, to um, redline it and highlight it and kind of anchor where this is. Um, and now here I'm going in and, and selecting that markup and saying, oh yeah, that's, that's a particular part. Let's take a, a greater look at this machine, load in the, the full assembly here. And, and now it's modeled down to, to the individual nut of the individual bolt. And I can kind of investigate how to maintain this. Uh, here's, here's Tony's MakerBot again. Maybe these fans are too loud. So there's a, a piece of a markup there or, or a, a, um, a ticket that's been created saying, hey, we need to, um, maintain this machine. Let's let's go do that. I can load it again in the, the, the 3D preview here, both in, in the preview window and and in the, the 3D space. But since this is a dashboard, and, and some organizations do run um, different factories, we've actually gone to a different site that that we've built up. Uh, here's here's let's say the French site. We see an army of those maker bots in in the background, uh, but then also we have these kind of large machines here in the foreground. And in fact, it. When I started at TechSoft, it was this machine. Uh, we, it was really impressive to just load one machine into um, uh, a desktop session. So this, this machine has over uh, 40,000 individual parts. And I think we have like 
five or six of them here, um, and, and hundreds of thousands of triangles by the time you load it. So just a, a number of different ways to kind of uh, switch between the two different sites very quickly, be able to show you what is possible with, with animating um, and navigating your, your, your 3D data and be able, to, be able to kind of connect all of the dots and, and bring this all together uh, and, and be able to visualize uh, and, and work with it. So to wrap things up, manufacturing in the digital factory, um, we're seeing people leverage the digital twin to simulate and optimize. And how are they doing that? Well, when it comes to flow and process, they're able to simulate and optimize the flow and layout of their, of their factories and the processes that are happening there. Um, they're simulating and optimizing machine control. So for CN, uh, CNC, for CMM machines, inspection quality assurance machines, as well as the robots that are in the factory, how do we simulate and optimize um, their operation and really it comes comes down to the rich data that powers those decisions and then also ar and iot um, is really enabling operations to be improved as well how do you do that well you need rich data translation and uh, techsoft you can do that using hoops exchange uh, you also need in order to simulate and optimize you need powerful integrated graphics and so that's uh, the product Hoops Visualize for desktop and mobile and Hoops Communicator uh, for, for web graphics. You also may need robust data processing tools. So for 3D printing or just mesh processing, that would be MachineWorks Polygonica, which we, we resell at Techsoft, um, or it could be Parasolid from Siemens. Again, we, we resell for um, doing solid modeling at, um, using their Parasolid SDK. You also need a strategic technology partner, and we'd like to be that for you here at Techsoft, to be able to work with you and build the, the, these solutions for the digital factory and, and the solutions of the future. So if, if that interests you, we'd welcome you to go to the URL here on our webpage to evaluate our software. We have a, a free 60-day evaluation of any of our, our toolkits um, and we pair you with one of our consulting engineers to do that. Um, and you can see for yourself the power of, of the, these different solutions. Um, we have a few minutes before we'll invite Angelo to chat um, with us about what they're doing at Stratasys. Before we do that, I'd be happy to answer any questions or have one of my colleagues answer questions, Tony or Martin, or Maria. Um, so if, if there's any questions, type them there in the chat. If, if not, we'll We'll send it over uh, and, and invite Angela to, to talk about what, what he's prepared for us today. Well, that's fine. We'll have an opportunity at the end as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing. I'd like to introduce Angela, Tr Angelo Tradunio from Stratasys uh, a world leader when it comes to additive manufacturing. You still with us, Angelo? Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Thank you so much yes. for joining us today. I'm sharing my screen. Let me know if you can see it. Yeah, it looks, looks good. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to talk. And thank you very much for mentioning uh, MakerBot uh, a few times, given that MakerBot is one of our products uh, as well. So that's, that's good. Um, uh, well, welcome everybody, and thanks for uh, in advance for listening to me for the next 15 minutes or so. Uh, my name is Angelo Tardunio. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Stratasys. I've been working for uh, the company for the last five years, mostly because that's when uh, Stratasys acquired GrabCut, which was the company I was working for uh, at that time. Um, prior to that, I was working for two years. And already then we were using uh, Texo 3D, specifically Communicator, but also Exchange as one of the, uh, the product to make us a successful startup back then. And now we're using the product to make us a successful company in general. Uh, a few words about uh, the company itself, uh, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, so we are, we are a 3D printing company, uh, although nowadays we call ourselves a solution company. So we'll provide you a package of software and printers and also expertise to, uh, to make you a successful uh, manufacturing uh, or prototyping company. Or also if you work in, uh, in arts or cinema uh, to uh, take advantage of our technologies. Uh, we are 
uh, operate, uh, we operate in uh, four manufacturing locations, 13 countries, uh, and the headquarters are shared between Eden Prairie in Minnesota and Rehoboth in, uh, um, in Israel. And that's because Stratasys itself uh, is actually a company that was uh, created as a merger between two companies. One, there was uh, Stratasys itself that was founded and, uh, uh, as headquarters in Minnesota. In another one, there was Object that was founded and had headquarters in Israel in Rehoboth. Uh, where do we come from? Uh, so we GrabCAD became the, the de facto uh, software division of the company, and we have uh, um, we are based mostly in Boston, Tallinn, Estonia, and in Cambridge in the UK. That's where I am based. Mostly, our company focuses on two types of technologies. One is the FDM technology uh, that was uh, created by one of the well, the founder of uh, Stratasys, that is Scott Crump, and is the FDM technology. It makes use of uh, uh, standard engineering grade plastics and they are deposited by uh, melting the plastic on a tray and then creating new models. And also the plastic, uh, some of them are actually certified to be used in aerospace, uh, can actually be manufactured. And then the other technology that we use is polyjet. And as instead of using a thermoplastic, we're using a thermoset that is cured using UV lights and allow us to create the most beautiful models with a very high uh, level of details and colors, transparency, and including other uh, properties like uh, shore and flexibility. So where do our customers use 3D printing? Uh, well, they use it for rapid, rapid prototyping. That's actually the original name of 3D printing. It was a rapid, rapid prototype. But as the technology evolved, we started seeing people using them for end production parts and also for tooling. And you can see the benefits and the use cases for the different, uh, for the different uh, areas. But the bottom line is that 3D printing has been around for quite a long time, though, although people think that it's quite a relative new technology, but it's been around on, from the early 80s and it's been carrying on until, well, until now. Uh, the thing is the workflow hasn't changed that much. We always have uh, a designer or somebody that wants to or the creative person that wants to create something uh, that is in their mind. Uh, they are going to use different tools uh, ranging from a CAD package, 3D scanners, or uh, digital creation content software to create a digital twin, something that is in the mind, create it and design it, and they want to manufacture it. 3D printing can be the end goal or can be an intermediate goal to get something uh, to evaluate and help the decision making people to decide what is the final design that needs to be manufactured. And the aim is to save money and to speed up the process without having to have uh, more expensive uh, manufacturing um, technologies uh, involved. So let's say that we start with a, from a designer that has decided 3D printing is, is a technology for them. And they can range from any different type of uh, area of the uh, manufacturing, uh, any different industry, from engineering, automotive, aerospace, to medical industry, industrial design, entertainment of arts. But usually the designer doesn't have a deep understanding of the technology itself. So it doesn't really know how 3D printing can achieve or how does it work. So what I normally do is interact with an operator who is the person that actually have access to the 3D printing machine if the designer itself doesn't have one, uh, knows how the technology works, knows which technology is the best, for uh, a particular intent, and uh, also is able to operate the machine as the name operator uh, indicates, and also can do any, any form of uh, repairs or maintenance that's required. So the process of, from idea and design to uh, 3D printing, the process involved lots of, at least a collaboration between the designer and the operator. In the past, so that's when these machines up here, were there. It's actually, they're not that old, but still they're older than the new shiny ones that are down here. Um, what happened is that our designer used their tools and let's say SolidWorks or Autodesk or Linux or other uh, more arty uh, type of, uh, of software, created their, their models, they were happy and they called the designer say, or send an email and say, listen, I want to print this. What do you want? And the answer from the operator was generally an SDL. And that's because that's, SDL was created by the people that invented 3D printing. 
uh, originally it, the name meant something that was theory lithography format. Then it changed to be standard triangulation or standard triangle language, just to uh, to change it and make it a bit more appealing. And uh, it was okay for the older printers because they just printed one material. They were a bit dumb. I mean, they were complicated for then, but uh, they didn't need them much more than the geometry. The thing is that now there's so much that can go into these files on the left that transforming them into an STL is the same as going from a nice big steak with some minced meat with a mince grinder in, the, in between. By the way, this is a vegan steak and this is vegan mince to make things like more vegan friendly. Uh, but the bottom line is that during this process, from going from these files on the left to the STL, is that there's lots of information that is lost. And to make up for it, especially to make use of these expensive but very cool printers, the designer has to talk to the operator a few times. There's lots of back and forth to define the materials, to say, oh, I need this to be in this color, to this be, to be this thickness or whatever. And this equates to money and time. And that's what we want to avoid. That's what 3D print is there for, to make things faster and cheaper. That's where we can improve. And that's where Texas comes by not asking, not having to ask from the operator point of view, from the printed, printing company point of view, not having to ask for the designer to provide us with an STL. But we just say, just give us your file and maybe some extra information that these files cannot get to us yet because 3D printing is not really that well integrated in this software. So the product that we developed is called Grabka Print and uh, it's powered internally by Hooks Exchange, which is one of the SDKs that was mentioned earlier by Jonathan. And we'll be using exchanges basically to get us the rich information that is provided by the user and put into CAD. More specifically for my, the purpose of my presentation is more color, the topology information, the assembly structure, but there's more that will come with it, like information about material and information about strength, these sort of things, we'll be able to extract them in the future. Uh, as I said, there's other printer specific information that we need. For instance, uh, one of our printers, well, the printers here, uh, the J750, uh, uh, which is this one, or the new, brand new J55, uh, they can actually print uh, Pantone colors. And at the moment, there's no direct integration for Pantone colors in the CAD software. So we provide it in our software so people can decide, I want this color to be this specific Pantone color. They can select it and print their shiny parts. So how do we do it? Well, let's see if the video works. If it doesn't, I'll try and change it. I don't know if I enabled the, the audio, but it shouldn't be that much apart from some later, but it doesn't really matter. So I'll, uh, I'll talk over it. There's some, uh, subtitles or titles at the bottom to explain. But we start with a model, and this is the model that somebody has designed uh, using SOLIDWORKS in this case. And they've gone through the effort of assigning material, transparency, some finishes. And let's say that we want to make another change and for instance, make the top, uh, this is sort of a, uh, one of those earbuds, uh, true wireless earbuds that are out there and are everywhere. But let's say that we wanted to make a more personal and a light green, and I want to make the top faces of the earbuds green. So I go and select some green color in the appearances in SolidWorks and assign it just to the face. So you can assign it to the body, you can assign it just to the face. And I'll do the same for the other one. I'm very slow, but I'll get there in the end. So once I'm happy with the way things look, I can go and save my model. Now in the past, what the user would have done, and that's what I'm doing now as well, the user would have saved this assembly as an STL. They could have saved it as multiple files or as an individual file. Uh, in this case, I'm just gonna save it as one STL only. And I'm also saving the assembly as it is. And that's because that's what I'm gonna use to have a more powerful workflow. So when I've, once I've saved the file, uh, this I'm still creating the STL because I'm slower than when I'm talking. So I'll save the file and make sure it's what I want. And gives you a preview, you see the triangles, you might be happy or not, but let's assume that everything is, is nice. Now, I'll go into graphical print. Uh, this is the main application. Uh, there's a Stratasys J750, which is a polyjet printer uh, that's been 
selected, I'll import both the solidasm, the assembly, and the FCL that I just created. And that's where the magic of Texas happens. So you see here, and you see here that it's loading the part, and that's when we interact with Exchange to get the uh, assembly structure of the model and extract all the information. And you see the first difference. This is my STL. It's coming up as white. That's because the default material is white. And this is what we get from Hoops. And it's got all the colors that I wanted, including the transparency. So if the aim was just to print what I designed, I'm done. I just need to, print, to press print uh, and I'm done. But we don't stop there. Because the user may want to change different color, uh, test different color combinations. They want, for instance, to uh, well change the material. So for the STL, I just have to change the color for the, just that one color. I'll go and select a certain pattern because I just want to show the user the main color of my uh, of my assembly. Now, if I go to the model imported with Exchange, I got much more power. Firstly, I could disassemble and assemble it and uh, print alternative covers, for instance. In this case, I'm just making duplicates of the same model and I'm just changing the color of the cover and having a transparent red or a blue transparent or a green transparent model. There's something that went wrong with the um, compression of the, of the video, the, the, the color palette is, the gamut is not as bad as it's shown there. But the idea is that in, with a few clicks, I just changed the color completely. I didn't have to ask my uh, user to go back and change the colors in the original software. Now, here I'm using a, a, another uh, approach. I just identified the cover, and I'm just going to make copies of it. So I'm going to hide it from my original assembly because I want to test that the actual cover can slide back and forth. So I'm going to hide it from here so it won't be printed. And then I make some copies on my tray and I just test different colors. So I'll go and select a pantheon color, for instance, and I say I want to pink. And I make a few duplicates of it and I test other pantheon colors that I might be interested in. So I'll go and, yeah, do a different selection. Now, in this presentation, I just focus on, on things like color uh, and transparency, but we got other range of material that actually uh, can, can uh, mimic things like rubber. So you got some flexibility. So if you want to print, uh, print something that is uh, like a remote control, you can actually print the buttons and they feel like the buttons in a remote control. So you can get that tactile uh, feedback to the users. So once I managed to select all the colors that I want, because I really wanted a green and I really wanted whatever other color I select, probably an orange, because it's the one that's missing. Yes, I was right. All is left is to press print. Now, you might hear the sound if I enable it. If not, well, you won't hear it. It's just a cool noise because I don't know how many people have heard that, that noise. I will hear it. Tell me if you do. I'll be quiet in case you hear it. Hours later, because I'm not claiming that it's going to be very quick. What you have is, well, the printing models here is something that I had in a presentation because, well, uh, the office is closed, as you might know, like we are in the middle of a global pandemic. But I managed to go to the office and print some. So if you can see my screen, tell me if you can, because I cannot see me. Uh, it's the same model. Uh, it was printed slightly differently uh, because, well, people have added some extra faces and colors. But I got two different examples for different colors. So people can go and change their colors and try different things. But I think this model with two, two of these took like three hours to print, but it's incredibly high resolution. So you actually cannot feel it, cannot feel the slices. And I think that I'm actually 
done. So thank you very much. I hope it was clear and uh, I'll be happy to answer any question you might have. Fantastic. Thanks, Angelo. Yeah, thank you very much, Angelo, for that. So we do have um, some time before we adjourn. So if anybody does have questions for, for Angelo or for uh, Tony or myself, uh, TechSoft, we'd be happy to answer them right now. Um, I know I, I have a, f a few questions for you, Angelo. I'm gonna just kind of share our final slide here and make sure that we have a chat open. All right, so if you have questions, please uh, either speak up or add, add them to the chat there. Um, but I, I'm curious, you were really emphasizing, Angelo, the, the power of bringing the original CAD data into your system. And that's, that is extremely powerful, um, kind of short, shortcuts a lot of the workflow in a good way. Um, but still, do you have any idea of, of how much STL versus CAD, like CATIA or, or SOLIDWORKS or Inventor data that you're seeing, like what the, what the split is? I don't have the exact numbers, but I can tell you the vast majority is still STL. Uh, we can see though that for things uh, coming mostly from uh, art and entertainment, people are really pushing to get, to get more that is not just an STL because for them it's much more complicated to, to get what they want. Um, for CAD, uh, we started to get things better. And I mean, the, the, these things you saw like about being able to uh, assign face colors and face transparency, whatever that means, because it's a big controversial transparency for a face. Um, uh, it just went two releases ago and we're working on expanding that. Uh, they were able to do it for bodies, so we were getting that information for bodies, but changing to the face is actually uh, giving the user much more power. And I mean, things like the, the model I showed earlier, this one, I mean, this is just done by having uh, extra faces imprinted on, on that top and assigning the color. But this is, will change. The customers are a bit, there's a bit of inertia in changing workflows. And uh, also for the operators, they, they trust their old workflows and starting from an STL and communicating with the, uh, the customers. But we can see that things are starting to change. And in, in, our, in our mind, we kind of want to merge the two, the operators and the designer. We want to go in the, and everybody should, that cares or wants to use 3D printing should have at least maybe a smaller one or uh, maybe the J55 that we just released. We want them to have in their office and then be, being able to just press a button and, and have it there. I don't need an operator. I have a machine that doesn't require that much maintenance. It's easy to operate. I don't have to have the knowledge to go from CAD model to STL to whatever the printer accepts. I just want to load in GrabCAD print, press the button, and I'll get what I saw in my screen. But I, to answer your question, at the moment, the majority is still coming from STLs. Yeah, thanks for that. Another question, how many factories are using the Techsoft control panel currently? None. And <laughs> There won't be any. <laughs> um, so that was, I think you're talking about the, the demo about the connected factory. That's a, that's a demo. We, we um, aren't marketing control technology for factories, but the, the underlying technology which allows you to build that software. And so um, I think the Hoops Communicator and Hoops Exchange are powering numerous companies um, in this in this space like let's say depending on what you look at uh, goes into a factory maybe maybe 50 to 100 different um, different software vendors are using techsoft technology in one way or another uh, in order to, to power their workflows but there's no and there's no um, there's no plan to commercialize that control panel and uh, it's just a way to, to showcase how you may integrate um, our technology within a web context and be able to bring data in, and and that's that's what we what we focus on. Uh, another question for Angelo: How about three MF files? That seemed to come out with a 
kind of a, a big push. Uh, are you are you seeing need for uh, support for for that additive manufacturing format and value in, in those, or is that something that kind of came and went? Uh, well, I'm uh, the strategy representative at the 3MF consortium, so I can vouch for that. Uh, 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 we see that as another way in uh, to 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 capture to capture that, that intent from the designer point of view. So we mm -hmm. see like a lot of effort from the major can vendors to export uh, into 3MF, uh, also because they are part of the consortium themselves. So we sort of talk to them and we we. Uh, interact uh, between the uh, machine producers and the and the content creators, uh, but we, we can see that, uh, but we don't see them as an exclusive because 3MF, it's relatively new, but it's getting better. But at the same time, there's lots that Texas provides that 3MF cannot provide at the same time. So at the moment, we're trying to give our users as much opportunity. Uh, mm -hmm. So we just released the support for 3MF, uh, which is in, in in beta, so people can actually get the same models that we printed using 3MF, so they can export a 3MF and print them with color. But it's uh, either or not an exclusion, well, exclusive. Great, thank you. Uh, is the, so another one for you, Angelo, is the viewer that you showed um, using Hoops Communicator, that's our, our web um, graphics tool? Uh, no, that is using our in-house uh, scene and uh, viewing technology. Uh, so what we're using is just Exchange. We're using a communicator for our viewer in the in the cloud, uh, which is uh, uh, GrabCAD, the old website and the old uh, um, workbench, uh, and we're using that for another product that we have that's called uh, uh, Grab, the GrabCAD Shop, which is used for ma for managing your um, your queues and your printing, so like to make sure that you're printing the right thing on the right machine. But for GrabCAD Print, the print prep tool that is just what I demoed, we're just using our own viewer. I see. So if you go to GrabCAD.com. The GrabCAD viewer is part of that engineering community is powered by Communicator. Yes, you will see it in the, in the viewer, uh, in both in the, uh, in the community viewer and in Workbench, which is now free since 2015. Uh, that is powered by uh, uh, Communicator. And is GrabCAD print, is that a desktop application or a web application? It's a desktop application only for uh, Windows at the moment, but it's uh, built using uh, web technologies. So there's, there's the scope to be ported outside, but hasn't been done yet. And, I'm, and I cannot comment on when or if that's gonna happen. I see. That is, and I'm curious, is that using Electron? Yeah. Tech? Very, very cool. That's a, that's a, great, that's a great way to bring in um, Kind of web web technology into a desktop context. We we see a couple people in this space using Electron. It seems to work quite well. Yeah, it sort of uh, flows because we were a web company. We we're doing a web application, and uh, it sort of flows from web using the same technologies and uh, bring them into the desktop. Great, great, very good. Well, it's um, it's kind of time to, to say goodbye. We do appreciate everyone for joining us today. We would have loved to be in person and we, we hope to see you soon and, and Angela, wherever we may be in 2021, look forward to spending some time with you. Thank you so much for your presentation today. That was, that was great. And thank you everyone for, for being part of our community. You know, we're gonna lean into the struggle together and so we're happy to see you. We hope that everyone stays healthy and stays well, stays safe. And we look forward to seeing you either in, in the virtual world or, um, or, or in person.